Welcome everyone. Uh, this is our uh, last webinar of this year, 2020. Uh, we have again uh, Scott Aronson. Uh, thank you very much to him uh, to accept our invitation. Uh, so recently there is a, another big milestone, uh, let's say happened uh, in quantum technologies, uh, another superiority result of uh, quantum computers, but this time with uh, boson sampling. Uh, Scott already had a blog about this and we also invited him and thanks to him uh, to be with us. The question and answer session. Uh, we have already collected many questions. So today our moderators will be Aural and Gibran. Uh, Aural is from QCheck and Gibran is from QPakistan. Uh, both group also recently uh, joined to QWorld. So uh, let me shortly mention how we will proceed. Uh, as usual, each uh, QWERT event has a code of contact. So we are here to talk about quantum, uh, science, education, and technology, and let's stick to plan. And also, please don't record or broadcast this meeting. Uh, we are already recording, and uh, we will uh, post uh, available, uh, we make it available on the YouTube later, and we will also inform you by email. So you can ask your questions by making comment on YouTube or on uh, Zoom. And our moderators uh, collect these questions and then ask the Scott. Of course, they may filter uh, some of them. Uh, we already have some questions and depends on our availability, we will ask the questions. So I want to just make a short, uh, let's say summarize uh, what we did as a keyword until now. So this year uh, we finally managed to form us as a non-profit organization. Now we are legal. Uh, so we are operating globally. We have uh, many local groups uh, and we are trying to building uh, open quantum ecosystems uh, like with uh, some other uh, partners and uh, players. So until now we hand out more than 1,500 diplomas. We are uh, proud of this. Uh, we also implemented a couple of international projects already. Uh, in 2009, uh, we had a project called QDrive. We drove by a car and uh, just uh, conduct some uh, workshops in different cities and countries in Europe. Uh, last summer, we organized our first internship program. And this September, we organized our first mentor training program. And maybe uh, one of the very recent uh, nice activity, we organized our first global workshops also in November. And we had uh, more than 700 participants from more than 70 countries. So in total, we have almost uh, organized 50 workshops and three hackathons. We are also regularly organizing Q talks, Q webinars. And uh, yeah, thanks again, uh, Scott, they, we will be with him. Uh, so in our network, we have 11 uh, local groups. We call them as like quantum cousins. So now we are in uh, four different continents. Uh, so, and soon we are also will entangle with Q India, Q Greece, Q Morocco, and Q Romania. And as also new uh, progress under our Q research department, we also initiated uh, <coughs> collaborative uh, research projects and also started some uh, reading and study groups. So these are the all uh, summary and uh, a new year is coming. I think this 2020 was hard due to pandemic for all of us. Hopefully this uh, fresh year will be much better uh, for us, uh, both for uh, our health side and also for the quantum. So now I will uh, stop my uh, sharing. And uh, Aural uh, will share the questions and Gibran will start the first uh, questions. Okay, Gibran, you may proceed. Sure. Um, I'll just wait for Aural to share the screen. Yep, <clears throat> okay, there it is. Right. So thank you again, Scott. And I guess what we will do is like jump into the midst of it because you very generously kept us informed via your blog about the recent Gaussian boson sampling experiment and the, anal the ongoing analysis of it but there's been kind of a week's silence since the last update on the blog. Yeah. So I'm wondering if I, mean, there are I, 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 wish, I wish I wish that I had a, a lot more information since then, but uh, uh, I'm not sure if I do. But on the other hand, you know, I'm happy to clarify things and even even just brainstorm uh, with the people here. Sure. Um, so maybe uh, we can also use just this point to uh, also 
uh, kind of get everyone on the same page in terms of identifying what are the problems that we're talking about when we refer to yes. bone sampling versus random circuit sampling. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, where where should I start? Uh, um, so yeah, so I think if there are no updates, so maybe just, you know, kind of a brief primer on what the problem is that we are looking at. All right. Well, um, um, boson sampling uh, is a uh, proposal uh, from a decade ago uh, that um, Alex Arkhipov and I described uh, for uh, trying to, you know, achieve uh, quantum supremacy uh, using a very rudimentary uh, uh, photonic device. Uh, so let's say a device that just um, generates a bunch of photons, uh, sends them through a network of beam splitters, and then measures where they end up. Okay, now, uh, such a device, uh, we don't think would be a universal quantum computer, or even for that matter, a universal classical computer. Okay, uh, uh, you know, we don't even know how to do like a C naught operation. Okay, but um, uh, the point that we made is that, you know, it samples from some probability distribution that, that seems interesting, okay? Uh, so it's a distribution over uh, lists of photon occupation numbers, which means, you know, the, you can measure each mode, you know, each place where a photon could be, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> um, at least ideally, you know, you would detect how many photons there are in that mode, right, which is some uh, um, 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 integer, uh, zero or greater. And, uh, you know, if, if uh, you had complete control over the experiment, you know, in practice, you don't. And of course, we'll have to come back to that point. But uh, in an ideal case, you know, you would control the exact number of photons that came in, let's say 50 would come in, if none get lost, then 50 come out. And so you get a list of, so each possible output is a list of non-negative integers summing up to, to, uh, to 50 in that case. Uh, right, it's just where the photons ended up uh, in this run. And uh, what is this good for? Uh, well, we, don't, we, have, we really have no idea, uh, uh, except that uh, it seems like it should be good for uh, you know, refuting people who, who believe that uh, exponential quantum speedups uh, were not possible uh, in our world. And the reason for that is that if you look at the amplitude for each possible output uh, uh, state, then um, it, it corresponds to the permanence of some n by n matrix, where again, n is the number of photons. And um, you know, the permanent is a famous uh, hard function in classical uh, complexity theory. Uh, and, um, um, you know, and, and, and you know, these are, these are permanents of, of uh, uh, complex matrices. So, you know, there's an enormous amount of cancellation uh, when you try to compute them. And, uh, you know, the, the probability of seeing some particular outcome is, of course, you know, the squared absolute value of its amplitude. So the squared absolute value of the permanent of some matrix. And so you have this huge amount of cancellation taking place among exponentially many terms. And whether this is a likely outcome or not depends on the tiny residue that's left over, right? Is that a, a large or a small uh, a residue, okay? Now, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the tricky part is that, you know, even though the permanent is this famous hard function, it's a sharp P complete and so forth, uh, that does not uh, 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 immediately imply that boson sampling itself uh, is a hard problem, okay? And that's true for several reasons. I mean, for, uh, first of all, we have to worry about uh, approximation. We have to worry about, uh, you know, the average case uh, and, and so, so forth. But even more fundamentally, you know, this experiment does not actually tell us uh, the permanent of a matrix of our choice, right? Because we don't get to control which output we see. Okay, so boson sampling is inherently a sampling problem, right? It's every time you run the experiment, you may see a different output. Uh, and uh, uh, so what you're forced to do is some kind of statistical test on the outputs that you see. Uh, you have to see, you know, am I preferentially seeing the outputs that were supposed to be associated with matrices with larger permanence, okay? And uh, so that's a more abstract, you know, task. But, you know, uh, the point that Arkhipov and I made was that, you know, this already looks like something that a classical computer would have a very hard time doing. Namely, just to generate a bunch of matrices that are skewed 
towards matrices that have large permanence, you know, but are sort of otherwise random or, you know, otherwise random sub matrices of a, of a given matrix. Uh, so, uh, you know, we gave some complexity theoretic evidence that this is already a hard problem. If you could do it efficiently, it would collapse the polynomial hierarchy and, and so forth. Um, uh, but now, you know, as I said, you know, to get from this, you know, we, we came at the subject sort of from a very, very theoretical point of view. Uh, but, you know, almost immediately after we published this, we came in close contact with experimentalists with quantum optics people who actually wanted to implement this thing. And, uh, you know, that's been one of the more exciting things that I've ever been involved with. Uh, but, you know, it's meant that, that there was a huge amount of bridging to do, okay? Because suddenly we have to work, you know, in addition to all of the issues that I just mentioned about, uh, you know, we, we have to do some statistical tests on the, the outputs. How hard is it for a classical computer to, to spoof that test? Uh, uh, you know, it's even just, just approximately. Now we have to worry about uh, noise in the experiment, and we have to worry about all sorts of other issues. So the, ex you know, very very quickly, the experimentalists uh, told us, look, you know, these single photon initial states that you and Arkhipov or you know are talking about, that doesn't exist in the lab today, right? You know, we don't know how to do that. Uh, what we know how to produce is uh, something else, uh, you know, Gaussian states. Uh, for example, these uh, squeezed states. And, um, you know, so now uh, they said, you know, can, can you also do a hard problem, you know, with, 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 with those sorts of sources? Okay, so just to, just to clarify uh, here, you know, a, uh, the, the simplest type of, of Gaussian state would be what's called a coherent state, which is, you know, the output of a, of a laser, for example. And it's, it's a superposition. So it's, so it's not, you know, you don't know for sure how many photons you have. Okay, you've got a superposition over different numbers of photons uh, in, in your source. And um, um, unfortunately, uh, you know, if, if your inputs are purely coherent states, then they, they behave just like classical light does. And there is an efficient classical simulation. Okay, so, so we know that with a standard laser, you know, you cannot get quantum supremacy this way. Okay, so, so that's out. Okay, but then you can look at the, you know, the, the sort of the next more complicated thing. Uh, uh, so the, there are these uh, things called Gaussian states that the experimentalists are also, you know, happier with than, than to produce just, you know, a single photon uh, deterministically and on demand. Uh, and um, so, uh, so, so some of the experimentalists had a big realization uh, around 2013 which I then, you know, gave a name to of a scattershot boson sampling, okay? And uh, their realization basically was that when you have these Gaussian sources, what you can do is you can just attenuate them a lot so that most of the time they're not generating any photon at all, but, you know, occasionally they'll generate one photon. Even more occasionally they'll generate two photons or three photons, okay? But you can be in a regime where probably, you know, almost all of your sources are generating either no photons or one photon. And, you know, you don't know in advance which sources are going to generate a photon, but whichever ones do, you can define those uh, uh, in retrospect to have been the initial states, you know, and, and, you know, in this way, you can just simulate uh, an ordinary boson sampling setup, like the original setup of me and Arkhipov. And so, you know, just from this, you know, these the sort of um, um, obvious in retrospect thoughts, you know, the, you know uh, which were not thoughts that we had had, uh, you know, we can conclude that boson sampling with Gaussian states, uh, uh, you know, um, 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 must uh, have a case that is hard to simulate with a classical computer uh, if ordinary boson sampling does. Okay, so there, there is a reduction between the two. Uh, you know, now all, all of this is assuming that we have measurements that can measure whether a photon is present or not, uh, or, or, or better yet, measure how many photons there are uh, in each output mode. Okay, uh, and, you know, and that is, you know, th those measurements, if you like, are what sort of break us out of the sort of Gaussian formalism where everything is just easy to simulate with a classical computer. Okay, so, so in this way, you know, we were, we were sort of able to take the theoretical proposal and move it closer to what the experimentalists, you know, uh, uh, explained to us 
you know, could, 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 could actually be done uh, with, with technology that exists, right? Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, with single photons, the hard part is, you know, you don't know when you're going to generate one. And so if I have like N sources, the chance that they'll all happen to generate a photon at the same exact same time as is needed with boson sampling, you know, decreases exponentially with N. Okay, scattershot boson sampling was a way around that problem. Now, the whole subject of boson sampling continued to develop, you know, uh, in the seven years since then. Um, I was not paying nearly as much attention uh, as I should have been, you know, and part of the reason for that is that, you know, a different approach to quantum supremacy, you know, started uh, uh, sort of taking up all of the oxygen, and that was, you know, the approach by a superconducting qubit which around, you know, 2014, and, you know, it became clear that Google was going to pursue quantum supremacy by that route. And, you know, they wanted us to sort of adapt the theory, you know, from things like boson sampling to that setting, you know, and of course we were, we were happy to help them with that. And, you know, and, and that setting, you know, of sort of random quantum circuits even had some advantages over boson sampling, uh, some theoretical advantages, which, which, which we can come back to sort of, you know, that it has less mathematical structure and elegance than boson sampling. But if you're trying to evade uh, uh, simulation by a classical computer, then, you know, being more inelegant, being messier can actually be a good thing, right? So, uh, so, so I, uh, you know, in, in the time that I spent on quantum supremacy at all, I mostly thought about uh, random circuit sampling about, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, about, about qubits. Uh, but, you know, this, uh, as I said, boson sampling continued to develop. Now, some of the important things that happened, uh, um, first of all, um, um, in, in uh, um, 2016, uh, a group of authors, including uh, Christine Silberhorn uh, and others, uh, uh, proposed a generalization of scattershot boson sampling, uh, which they called Gaussian boson sampling, GBS. Okay, this just means boson sampling where your initial state could be any uh, Gaussian state. Uh, and, you know, so as, as I said, this includes scattershot boson sampling as a special case, you know, which were, which is, you know, uh, uh, as hard to simulate as any kind of boson sampling. But, uh, what, what is relevant today is that, you know, people like uh, uh, the, the USTC group, you know, which with its new result are doing uh, um, sort of random Gaussian boson sampling. Uh, and, and for that, you know, we would really need a new complexity analysis, which, which, which I would say has not really been done. Uh, now, with Gaussian boson sampling, it turns out that the probabilities of the output states, uh, instead of being the absolute squares of permanence, they are a different function of a matrix, uh, which is uh, called the half need. Okay, uh, so in the same way that the permanent sort of counts the number of perfect matchings in a bipartite graph, uh, the half need counts the number of perfect matchings in a general graph, you know, given its adjacency matrix. Okay, so it's, it's some more complicated sharp P complete function. And, you know, in Gaussian boson sampling, you get these half neons. Um, in, the, in the new work, in the new experiment from USTC, they talk about yet another function, which they call the Turantonian. Uh, so the Turantonian was just invented a couple of years ago, but it's just like the, the analog of the half neon for when you only have uh, uh, detectors that tell you whether one or more photons are present and when they don't count the number of photons. Okay, so you get these Torontonians, and I expect that a similar complexity analysis as our Arkhipov and I did for the permanent could be done for the Hafnian for the Torontonian. So you would start with an assumption that you know half random Hafnians are hard to approximate or sharp P hard, let's say, to approximate uh, in the average case, uh, uh, you know, and, and for some reasonable ensemble, and then you would conclude that approximate Gaussian, Gaussian boson sampling is hard to simulate with a classical computer. Uh, that has not been done yet. Uh, that, you know, I would love for, uh, if, if, if anyone here wants to do that analysis. Um, now, uh, uh, you know, what, what uh, um, you know, of course the, the, uh, the big uh, announcement from, you know, this month that we're all excited about is uh, from, um, 
you know, the group at, at USTC, uh, uh, you know, uh, led by uh, um, um, Chow Yang Liu, um, um, you know, I guess uh, under the auspices of uh, uh, Jianwei Pan. And uh, they have reported that they have done Gaussian boson sampling. So that's the, the, the 2016 variant of boson sampling uh, with uh, on average like 50 or so detected photons which you know, is potentially in the regime for quantum supremacy, let's say. Uh, now, figuring out whether it really is quantum supremacy you know, is a very complicated undertaking because you know, quantum supremacy is inherently a, a negative statement. It says that there is not a fast way to simulate this with a classical computer, right? And so now we have to throw things open to the whole community to figure out, you know, can they spoof these results with a classical computer? And, you know, now it's important to realize that this is a lossy experiment. So, you know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, of, of all the photons that are generated, maybe about a third of them make it all the way through to be detected. Uh, and there have been studies over the last seven years or so about the complexity of lossy boson sampling. Uh, we know Daniel Broad and I had a result that if only a few photons uh, get lost, then you retain the original hardness of boson sampling. But there are also results saying that if most of the photons get lost, say all but square root of n of them, then it becomes easy to simulate classically. Uh, there is an intermediate regime where uh, you know it's uh, it, it, it's a little bit tricky to say. Like you can get simulations that uh, would eventually become polynomial time, but you know, only when you scale to some tremendous number of photons. And then at some point, you know, may, like maybe you're saying that the experiment is easy, asymptotically easy to simulate, but only in the same sense that any non-error corrected quantum computer is sort of asymptotically easy to simulate, right? So we don't want to like uh, refute boson sampling by like an argument that would generalize to any quantum supremacy demonstration, you know, in the NISC era, right? We want to, uh, so, you know, so it, it's tricky to interpret some of these results, but, you know, one of the key um, uh, results for this whole discussion is a uh, 2014 paper by um, Gil Kalai and um, Guy Kindler. Um, Gil, of course, being a, you know, a skeptic of quantum computing for, for a very long time, but uh, in 2014, Kalai and Kindler had a technical paper uh, that said, here is our proposal for how to spoof a boson sampling experiment. Uh, and the proposal uh, involved some sort of mock-up distributions parameterized by some number K, where like if uh, roughly speaking, if K equals one, then you're pretending that your photons are completely distinguishable classical particles, right? And you're seeing what you would get then. Now, Already, the USTC group has ruled out that, that that could explain the results of their experiment. Okay, uh, now the k equals two case would be you have a distribution where you sort of correctly model the two photon interference, but not the three photon or interference among any larger numbers of photons. So basically, it's a distribution that you would calculate using two by two permanents uh, as your approximants. Uh, now, uh, recently, um, um, Chow Yang uh, you know, has, uh, informed us that, that they uh, did the test and they, they have also ruled out that the uh, sort of second level of the Kalai Kindler hierarchy could you know, explain the results uh, that they saw in their experiment. Okay, but roughly speaking, if you wanted to spoof results in sort of the Kth level of Kalai and Kindler's hierarchy, then this would should, should take classically, we think maybe like n to the k time. Okay, uh, you know where you know when k is n, then you converge to the ordinary, but you know to the ideal boson sampling distribution. So now you know th this this gives us a very nice way to ask the question: sort of which for which k can we rule out that you know that the sort of kth order spoofing could reproduce the results of this experiment? And uh, you know so they're doing some statistical tests. Uh, which they call HOG, you know, heavy output generation, which was a name that Luigi Chen and I coined a few years ago uh, in, in a different context. But, you know, it's important to understand, uh, you know, a difference between boson sampling and random circuit sampling, the thing that Google did last year. Um, with random circuit sampling, we had this 
fairly clear cut test. Google called it the linear cross entropy benchmark or linear XEB. Okay, and this was just some success measure that you compute using your classical computer, you know, with the outputs that are observed. And if it, you know, there's a certain threshold, which is what you could get by a classical computer that just guessed completely randomly, and which also happens to be about the best that we think that any efficient classical algorithm could get for this benchmark, right? So what that means is that all you have to do is do an experiment where you exceed that benchmark. And then it is, it, it is as if you violated the Bell inequality, right? It's, it's as if, you know, you have then, you know, a subject to or the, the computational assumptions, you've then demonstrated quantum supremacy. And that's exactly what the Google experiment did. Like, you know, the, the, the threshold is one, you know, the ideal value is two, but they're in their experiment, they achieved maybe 1.002. Uh, but, you know, they did enough statistics to prove that it was greater than one. Okay, uh, with boson sampling, we do not currently have the analog of that. Okay, so we have some statistical tests that you can apply, but we don't really know, uh, or we don't have a sort of strong complexity theoretic belief about what is the best that a classical spoofing algorithm could get on those success benchmarks. So we, so it's very hard to say sort of, you know, what target do the experimentalists have to hit in order to, for it to count as quantum supremacy? You know, as, as the way I put it in my blog post is that for now, to some extent, you know, we are playing a game of whack-a-mole, right? That someone can just propose a spoofing strategy and then, um, you know, the USTC group can rule that out. Someone else can prove another spoofing strategy, then, you know, they can try and try to rule that out and so forth. So that's basically the, the situation as I see it. That's where it stands now. But you know, I have um, probably yammered for too long. So let's let's get to, to let's uh, maybe like uh, questions that that I that I didn't already address. Um, just kind of following up on the last thing that you Please. finished up on, when we sure. frame the benchmarks in terms of uh, analogous to Bell inequalities. Yeah, um, they famously are kind of open to those interpretations in terms of well, we're all loopholes kind of. Yeah, uh, you know, filled in. Yeah, um, absolutely. Would we have all yeah. kind of those loopholes identified for this situation? Well, well, that that uh, in some sense that that's exactly what this entire discussion is about, right? Uh, you know, so like in, in the case of the Bell inequality, you know, there was the detection loophole, there was the locality loophole, for you know, people managed to devise experiments that closed one of the loopholes without closing the other one. And then just a few years ago, uh, the first experiments were done that closed both of these loopholes. And at, you know, at, at this point, it is very hard for me to think of any remaining loopholes in Bell experiments that, 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 that I would regard as sane, right? Like the only remaining loophole, you know, it seems to be this sort of metaphysical, you know, free will loophole that, you know, you can't ask for any experiment to ever close, right? So, um, 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 you know, but, but that would sort of require the whole world to be a conspiracy, right? So, uh, uh, so, okay, now what about in the case of quantum supremacy experiments, right? Well, here, you know, you could say the, 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 the most obvious loophole is the loophole that, you know, maybe someone has come up with a, a, will come up with a polynomial time classical algorithm that you haven't thought of, okay? So, you know, I mean, un, 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 unlike uh, with the Bell inequality, here, every statement that we make is, you know, relative to our current knowledge of complexity theory, right? It is conditional on some hardness assumption, okay? And, you know, and, and typically in complexity theory, we state our hardness assumptions asymptotically, but, you know, in a real experiment, it ultimately comes down to concrete numbers, okay? So, uh, you know, and it comes down to, you know, using uh, the supercomputers that are currently available or, you know, the high performance classical computing, can people feasibly spoof this experiment or not? Okay, and, you know, so, so, so you could say just like with deploying a crypto system, you know, there are a lot of similarities here to uh, applied cryptography, right, where, you know, you propose a crypto system, but the only uh, uh, um, the only proof of, of, of security that matters in the end is people have to try to break it and fail, okay? 
you can give theoretical asymptotic, you know, reductions that give evidence for hardness, but, uh, you know, those reductions might or might not be informative about, you know, the concrete values of N, you know, that are, you know, that, that arise in practice. So ultimately, people have to try to break the thing and fail. Okay, and it's the same with quantum supremacy. So, you know, what people are trying to do right now, you know, in spoofing this, you know, spoofing the results classically, this is exactly what has to happen. Okay, now, um, the, uh, you know, there are, there are other loopholes that you could, you could talk about. I mean, uh, you know, the, the current um, USTC experiment, you know, is not reconfigurable, right? So it's, it's, you know, you basically, you decide in advance what are the, uh, the, the beam splitter settings, right? And then you build the device. Uh, you know, and, and some people would say, oh, well, but, but that means that you fix the instance and, uh, uh, you know, which, which I would say, you know, oh, um, I'm okay, because, you know, even with a fixed instance, you know, boson sampling still seems like kind of a hard problem, right? Uh, uh, you know, but uh, of course, it would be better to have a reconfigurable system. You know, that was uh, one advantage that the Google uh, uh, experiment had over, over, over the USTC one. But now having said that, there is also a big advantage uh, that the USTC experiment has. And th this also relates to your question. This is another loophole uh, that, that, uh, that has actually closed now. Uh, after Google put out its quantum supremacy claim um, a year ago, then you know, a few weeks later, IBM put out this response saying basically, you, know, you Google have ignored a loophole, right? And the loophole was simply, uh, well, you know, you're doing this experiment with 53 qubits. That means that your output distribution, you know, is a distribution distribution over 53 bit strings, right? So it has uh, um, um, two to the 53 probabilities, which is about nine quadrillion. Okay, but nine quadrillion just so happens to be uh, uh, um, a small enough number that you know you could fit nine quadrillion parameters on the large on the hard disks of the largest supercomputers that are currently on the planet you know just 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 barely so but you could do it okay and you know what they said is that if you wanted to do this calculation just write the entire output distribution to hard disk you know if you could commandeer uh the biggest supercomputer on the planet you could probably do that in a few days okay and thereafter once you had that distribution then you could use it to easily generate as many future samples as you wanted. Okay. Now, the difference with the USTC experiment is that it's got a much larger number of output states, basically like 10 to the 30 instead of 10 to the 16. Okay. And so even if each particular amplitude is not much harder to calculate than it was in Google's case, you know, there's way more of them. Okay. And there's, in particular, there's way more than you could fit and the hard disks of even the you know the biggest supercomputers on the planet. Okay, so this so this is an example of how by improving an experiment, you know, by by, by doing a different experiment, you could evade uh, one of the loopholes that was pointed out, right? Although you know you're then subject to to other loopholes, uh, and you know you could say maybe may, may, maybe you know like um, in 2019 and 2020 we have finally entered the like the era of like where the Bell experiments were in the early 1980s, right? We have entered the era of, you know, Bell experiments that, you know, or, you know, of, of experiments that, 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 that should, you know, um, I think that absolutely provide evidence, you know, that should move a reasonable person's opinion, but that are not fully loophole free, right? And we are hoping to move more and more uh, toward a fully loophole free quantum supremacy experiment. Got it, yeah. Aurel, you want to take the next question? Sure. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, so let's move on to, to the other questions. Yeah. And um, you already had this analogy about uh, the Bell's um, inequalities. Yes. And I noticed another analogy that you made in the past. I think I found it uh, not on your blog, where you compared the, the significance of showing, showing quantum supremacy as to searching for the Higgs boson. Mm. And, um, and I, I, I would say that there are some differences because, well, 
I don't think there are too many controversies on how to call the Higgs boson, although maybe there are some. Whereas uh, there are some controversies how we should refer to quantum yeah. supremacy. And uh, well, that, well that, 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 I mean, I mean that, 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 that doesn't sound like a difference in the concept. That just sounds like a difference in naming. I mean, exactly. you know, and, 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 and by, by the way, I, 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 some, I have heard physicists argue that, that you know, uh, people other than Higgs, you know, should have shared credit for uh, the, uh, uh, the, for that proposal in the 1960s. But, you know, Higgs, um, um, Higgs had the easiest to pronounce name. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, for for whatever reasons the, na the name Higgs boson stuck, but you know, I mean, I mean, look, you you know, we can call quantum supremacy, you know, uh, quantum fluffiness, right? Or you know, we could call it any other name. It's not, you know, but uh, uh, um, 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 you know, I mean, I mean, look, every every analogy, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 fails at some point. It's only good for what it's good for, right? The, the specific context in which I, I uh, brought up the, the Higgs boson, I think, is that, you know, people uh, uh, would constantly say, okay, but these quantum supremacy experiments are not solving a useful problem, right? And they would say that, you know, as if, you know, the, uh, you know that that was just a, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the end of the discussion, right? You know, the, uh, you know, or, or as if this was something that no one had thought of before, right? And, uh, you know, and I would say, like, like, would you make the same argument about, you know, okay, fine, it's true that CERN found this Higgs boson, but it doesn't really count because it's not yet a useful boson, right? It's not, you know, you know, we can't yet use it to, uh, you know, in the way that we use uh, uh, positrons in, 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 in medicine, for example, right? I mean, it just, it just seems ridiculous. I mean, you know, the, the, we, are, we are exploring nature in a new regime here. We are trying to prove the reality of quantum speedups, you know, in our universe. Okay, that is, you know, that just seems absolutely basic, you know, as basic as as anything in physics. And um, uh, you know, and 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 I think that uh, uh, even if there were no application, you know, I would still be excited about that. You know, the fact that there are, we we hope, you know, some applications of quantum computing eventually. Uh, that is an you know icing on the cake, but you know let's build the cake and make sure that the cake is really there before we put the icing on it. So, do you think we're doing much better with quantum supremacy than uh, with the Higgs boson? Like uh, now we have uh, two experiments and not just CERN doing one. <laughs> I, I mean, okay, look, I mean, I mean, I, you know, the. the um, with 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 the Higgs boson, the issue is that you need to accelerate particles, you know, to uh, to extreme energies, and you know there is only one accelerator uh, on Earth right now that can, you know, produce the energies to do that. You know, and it costed about eleven billion dollars, which is which is still you know more than than the budget of any uh, quantum computing effort that that I know of. Although you know the quantum computing budgets have been growing, and you know may, maybe. Uh, at some point in our future, there, 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 there will be a crossover. But I mean, that, that, that's the reason why there's only one uh, large hadron collider. But, but they did actually have two separate experiments. They had ATLAS and CMS, right, which, sep which both separately from each other detected the Higgs boson. Okay, so, so there, you know, so for, for, for them, for us, for any experimental science, you know, re replication is very important. Okay, and you know, that is one reason why I'm excited about the effort to, do, to, to demonstrate quantum supremacy by a boson sampling. You know, it wasn't, you know, after Google, uh, uh, you know, announced their quantum supremacy uh, by superconducting qubits, it was not obvious that anyone was still going to bother with boson sampling, right? I, you know, I didn't know if, if they would or would or not, um, you know, but the, uh, um, you know, the um, um, actually Chow Yang told me that they were still working on it. I wished him the best, and you know, I, uh, um, you know, they, they, they actually, you know, they, they've now done exactly what they said they would do, right? And so, you know, so, so, you know, um, um, regardless of uh, what, 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 you know, the uh, what, what we learn in analyzing the experiment, I mean, hats off to them uh, for that, really. Uh, 
um, you know, and, and, you know, so I, I think even, you know, even, even um, if, if, if there was nothing new here, right, it is hugely important to have a replication, you know, you know, you know, to not have Google be the only one that is doing quantum supremacy, right, something becomes real when, you know, in, in empirical science, when lots of people can replicate it, when, you know, anyone who's determined enough can go and replicate it. And, you know, but, but, but in addition to that, you know, this, this, uh, this is the first time that there's a, a plausible claim of quantum supremacy using photonics. So it's sort of a, a, a proof of principle for the photonic, you know, path to, to quantum computing, which of course is also, you know, could ultimately be a, a, a way to build a universal quantum computer. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, the first, you know, claim of quantum supremacy that, you know, uh, uh, should should not be uh, uh, vulnerable to what we could call the IBM loophole of just storing the entire output distribution in hard disk. Okay, so so uh, so there are several, uh, you know, good things about this replication, uh, and I hope that it won't be the last replication. I think quantum supremacy is important enough that you know, let's see it with trapped ions. Uh, let's yeah, this see, yeah, this yeah. Yeah, yeah, this brings us, I think, to the next question. We can uh, skip to the fourth one, which is on, on the list. So, so um, yeah, how, how science should, should be like working? We know we do pre-reviewed uh, journals and um, uh, you mentioned the difficulties that you had to face as the reviewer. Do you think that uh, any changes would be desired or, or this is just how things are should be. Oh, I mean, uh, um, um, so, you know, science and nature have this um, embargo process, right, where they want to sort of uh, uh, keep a paper totally secret, you know, not, you know, have the authors put it on the archive or tell anyone. And then, you know, there's this secret reviewing process, and then the paper just gets released to the world with a big splash. Right, and, and you know, a bunch of media articles appear at the same time. And, you know, the trouble is that that entire model for releasing, a, a, you know, a, a, a new scientific result, you know, is not a great fit for quantum supremacy experiments, I feel like, right? Because with these experiments, you know, they're really, um, the, the confidence about the experiment is something that has to build up over time. Okay, it, it uh, you know, for exactly, as we were saying before, right? The whole community has to be able to take a crack at trying to reproduce the results classically, and and uh, um, you know, and 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 you know that 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 cannot just be the responsibility of one or two reviewers. Okay, now, um, you know, the um, um, science probably you know relied on me as a reviewer more than it should have. Uh, you know, and like I you know I, I told them you know I'm not uh, in. Uh, uh, experimental physicist, you know, I'm just a theoretical computer scientist, you know, uh, you know, you should not necessarily be, be relying on me for all of this stuff. Okay, but, you know, um, having said that, um, I am, you know, I, I actually, I, I do think that, 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 that you know, uh, publishing this paper was absolutely the right decision. Um, oh, is my, is my audio quality bad? Do people not hear me? There's, yeah, there's yes, some, it's bad. Yeah, there is some issue. Right, well, then maybe I should, should I log out and log back in? Yeah, let's try that. Yeah, let's try that. Right? Oh, I'm going to do that then. Okay. Hi, is this better? Is it's going hello? to land. Okay, is this better? Okay, good, good. All right, good. good. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, sorry about that. So yeah, so I, I think that in a, in a case like this, where you have, you know, this very, very serious experiment, you know, you know, and you, everyone, you know, even Gil Kala, even the skeptics, you know, agrees this is a very impressive experiment. 
you know, I think that the thing to do is get the paper out to the community, you know, in whatever form, you know, whether, you know, whether that's published in science or whether that's on the archive, whether that's both, you know, I mean, and, 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 and nowadays, you know, in the age of the internet, the truth is that it's going to get lots of attention, you know, even, even if it was just, you know, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, uh, the, the role of journals as gatekeepers, you know, of important scientific results has enormously decreased, right, and over the last couple decades, right, you know, they, they could have put it on some, you know, a uh, uh, random Facebook page and, it, you know, and, and people would have found it, okay. Uh, um, but, you know, what's important is that the result gets out there, you know, so that the whole community can have a track, have a crack at trying to understand it. Uh, and uh, seeing if they can, you know, uh, reproduce the results classically, which is exactly what's been happening over the last few weeks. Okay, thank you. I think with that, uh, we can move on to the questions from, from the audience. Okay. And, um, and we have, the first question was asked, asked you to comment on the experiment, but the thing is, this is the occasion <laughs> why we I've have- been, I've, been, I've been doing that this entire time. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is the occasion of this question and answer. Yeah. So I'm really yeah. really right. glad that the people who are joining they understand yeah. what uh, this is yeah, yeah. all about. Yeah, yeah. And um, and uh, you 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 already touched on this, but maybe you can. Is there is there a simple way to summarize what is really the difference between what Google has Google's experiment and, and yeah. this recent one? Yeah. So we so we've talked about this. Okay, but the Google experiment was random circuit sampling. Okay, so you take a collection of qubits, you apply random one and two qubit gates to them. Okay, and you know, this produces some, you know, messy, you know, scrambled up quantum state, uh, you know, which is a superposition involving two to the n amplitudes, you know, and then you measure, you just measure each qubit to see if it's zero or one. Okay, uh, now the USTC experiment, uh, well, it's boson sampling. Okay, so you take a, uh, a quantum state that now involves superpositions over different numbers of photons. Uh, you apply um, a network of beam splitters, okay, which are these, you know, which are sort of the linear optics analog of gates, um, you know, like a two mode uh, beam splitter, you know, maybe is a the rough analog of a two qubit gate. Okay, and, and then you measure, uh, uh, you measure each mode to see how many photons are in them. Okay, so, so at, a, at a high level, you know, it all sounds very sim similar, right? You do this random sequence of operations, you know, you, you, you produce this exponentially large state, you measure it, you look for the non-uniformities in the output. You look for certain uh, uh, types of outputs being more likely to occur uh, than, than, than other types of outputs. Okay, the differences are all in the details, okay? And, you know, one of the main differences is that for random circuit sampling, uh, our current conjecture is that the, um, um, an efficient classical algorithm basically gets no insight whatsoever about uh, the output distribution. Okay? If you wanted to spoof the results classically, basically the best you could do, you know, if you're not gonna do a, some heroic computation like what IBM proposed, you know, then short of that, you know, the best we think you could do is just generate some completely random output strip, right? Just totally uncorrelated with the quantum circuit, okay? And, you know, we, you know, if, you know given a particular output, we don't even know a fast classical way to estimate, you know, is it, is it likely to be a little bit bigger than average? Is it likely to be smaller than average? You know, we don't know how to estimate any of that. Okay, now with boson sampling, by contrast, we know that cla efficient classical algorithms can get some toehold, okay? Uh, we know that uh, partly because of some, you know, remarkable algorithms that were discovered uh, by uh, uh, 20 years ago or so by, by Leonid Gervitz. Uh, and what he showed is, is that you can, um, you can approximate uh, the permanent of a unitary matrix uh, to uh, uh, polynomial precision. In, um, um, in classical polynomial time. Uh, and, you know, in a boson sampling experiment, you can compute the marginal distribution over any K of the output modes in about N to the K time with a classical computer, okay? 
and you know and and the outputs are not completely uniform right and you can actually classically you can see those non uniformities right like i could with my classical computer i could generate a correct prediction you know that some modes will be likelier to have a photon in them than other modes will be okay and i could do that by just looking at you know the the, the sort of the, the 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 underlying reason for this if you like is that um in, 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 in quantum optics, we're dealing with a much smaller set of operations uh, than we are with, um, with qubits. Okay, like with qubits, I have just two to the n by two to the n unitary matrices. But in the case of optics, I only have m by m unitary matrices, where m is the number of modes in my experiment, right? And, you know, these then just uh, get lifted by some homomorphism to, uh, uh, you know, unitary operations on a much larger Hilbert space, but my underlying space of trans of unitary transformations is only m by m matrices. Okay, this is kind of the the, the deep difference, if, if you like, and and that leads to a bunch of th other things downstream, like that there are efficient classical algorithms that can tell me, you know, which modes are likelier to have a photon in them, that can take some output configuration and generate a guess, you know, about will this be likelier or less likely? And that guess will not be a very good guess, but it will be non-trivially correlated with the truth, okay? Again, for boson sampling, we know that that is possible, right? And so, so what that means is that the whole discussion of quantum supremacy for boson sampling takes on a different character than the discussion of quantum supremacy with random circuit sampling, because now there's not just this one benchmark that we can give people to exceed. Right now, it's a question of can you rule out this spoofing strategy or that one or that one, right? Uh, uh, because you know we don't really know what the best classical spoofing strategy is. We don't even have a, a very clear conjecture about that. It might be that it's something like Kali and Kindler's where you, know, you can spoof better and better as you're willing to invest greater and greater polynomial amounts of time. Um, but you know what, you know, no, no one has even done the calculation yet, I don't think, as to what, uh, um, um, how well would the higher levels of this Kali Kindler hierarchy uh, spoof the, uh, uh, the, the type of test that the USCC group is applying in its experiment. Okay, so these are all questions that need to be answered for boson sampling. This is some of what makes this conversation more complicated uh, than, than the, the, uh, the analogous one was for the, for the Google experiment. And then that was already not a very simple conversation. Right, right, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I, I will try to skip some questions. Okay. I would, um, but I would like to ask this, the, this one. So, um, so, so far, when we're talking about quantum supremacy, we have the, this uh, NISC wind and NISC regime, so noisy intermediate uh, size quantum. And mm -hmm. is, do you think there's any specific physical or, or, or theoretical reason why the sampling problems are the ones that have been shown and, and uh, not yeah. the others? Um, so I, 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 I do think so. You know, and this was one of the main realizations that you know, a bunch of us had uh, 12 years ago, uh, that, um, you know, once you start looking at sampling problems, then, you know, um, um, quantum speed ups become a much less special thing. They become somehow much more ubiquitous. Okay. And you know, maybe I could give intuition for that as follows, right? Yeah. Say you want a big quantum speed up for a decision problem. Or you know, let's say you know a problem like factoring that has a single right answer, right? Then what you are asking for is you know a an amazingly well choreographed pattern of quantum interference. Okay, you're asking for you know an interference experiment where you get destructive interference on every possible output you know uh, state except for the the few that, that that tell you about the prime factors of your number, right? Now, you know, this can be done, okay, but, you know, or, you know by, by a Shor's algorithm, uh, but, you know, it is far from an easy thing to arrange, right? It requires doing all of this modular exponentiation, 
on coherent superpositions of integers that are written in binary. Um, and yeah, we, we don't expect such things to be possible before the era of, of fully fault tolerant quantum computers. You know, and you could say, you know, it is because of the precision, you know, uh, the specificity of the interference pattern that you are trying to set up, right? Uh, you know, it is very unforgiving of any of, of anything wrong, the slightest thing wrong with your device. Okay, but now suppose by contrast that you want quantum supremacy via a sampling problem. Okay, then um, you know, and this is what we noticed years ago. It seems to to suffice to just do a totally random sequence of quantum operations. Right, just mix. You know, you just, just just try to mix things up and get to some random looking point in Hilbert space, right? Some, you know, won't be truly hard random, you know, but, uh, you know, some pseudo random place in Hilbert space. Uh, and, um, you know, and, 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 and the key point there is that a, a random point in Hilbert space, uh, you know, is not going to be like a uniform probability distribution because it will, uh, it will, um, you know, the, the amplitudes will be like Gaussian, you know, let's say, or they'll be, they'll be centered at zero, right? They'll have an average of zero, but they will fluctuate about that. And so some output states will be likelier than others. And now we can use that uh, as a statistical signature for quantum supremacy or as a potential signature, okay? That is exactly what these experiments do. And again, we got to it not with anything clever like Shor's algorithm, but just with a totally random sequence of operations, right? You know, that, that's actually one of the complaints that people have had about boson sampling or, you know, random circuit sampling, that it's too obvious, right? That, you know, like this shouldn't even count as a quantum algorithm because it's, it's too tautological, right? Well, indeed, you know, all of the, the interesting part here comes in, in uh, thinking about could what would a classical computer have to do to reproduce the result, right? Uh, you know, all, all the all the sort of uh, theoretically interesting stuff is, is now on on, on that side. Uh, but um, you know, but but you know, just uh, um, experimentally, you know, uh, what, what what we had to tell the experimentalists to do was was so much uh, uh, more forgiving than it was for Shor's algorithm, right? We could just tell them to do a random sequence of operations. And now, you know, to, to, to get quantum supremacy that way, you know, you might still need fault tolerance, right? You know, like, like it was not obvious to us whether you would or you wouldn't, but at least there's a shot to try to do this using, you know, 50 or 60 uh, or 100 uh, non-error corrected components. Um, so I think, I think regarding the Gaussian boson sampling, this is, right, this is exactly where we are. We're not quite sure whether whether it is tolerant to to the extent of noises and and that's and right that's whatsoever. right this is this is this, this yeah. is very much being invested I mean it has been investigated over the last six or seven years this experiment certainly provides a clear impetus to further investigate these questions uh, to put it mildly yeah, um, so I, I see that I see that Chow Yang uh, you know uh, in the chat said is it worth it to try the IQP approach. Which is yet another approach to quantum supremacy, uh, proposed um, independently of, of me and Arkhipov by, by Bremner, Joza, and Shepard, uh, also around 2010, 2011. Um, absolutely, uh, I would love for someone to implement that approach. Um, you know, with with you know that that is a qubit-based approach, so you could try it with superconducting qubits. You could try it with trapped ions. Um, you know, but then, uh, you know, it, it will come down to engineering questions, you know, can you actually implement these commuting Hamiltonians in a feasible way? And at the point when you can do that, could you just do random circuit sampling? So could you just do a, a maybe, you know, uh, a, a more secure uh, quantum supremacy thing, you know, or uh, is, there, is there a regime where it's actually advantageous? From an engineering standpoint, to do the um, the IQP approach, uh, I think those are very good questions, and I hope that the experimentalists uh, uh, look into them. And uh, do you personally think that the GBS, uh, like the Gaussian boson sampling, is going to turn out to be to be tolerant to these noises? 
uh, this is actually a question from from Craig Hamilton, and he he yeah. was the one who came up with the idea of Gaussian model sampling. Yeah. Which was, of course, a, a, an intuition and a conjecture in the beginning. And right. Well, okay. So so it, you know it it. it when, when you say noise, right, it, it all depends on how much noise we're talking about, okay? So uh, I, I, I expect that Gaussian boson sampling, you know, in the presence of a, of a very small amount of noise, you know, like a few lost photons uh, will be fine uh, by, you know, uh, some, some analog of the result that, that Daniel Broad and I proved uh, in 2016 for, um, you know, for, for ordinary boson sampling, right? You know, you can you can tolerate a small number of losses. Uh, I expect that you know, and I, I, this may have already been shown actually that Gaussian boson sampling, where all but square root of n of the photons get lost, is just easy to simulate classically. Uh, uh, full stop. Um, mm -hmm. And so then, you know, the, the question becomes one about intermediate regimes. Um, my understanding of the of the situation is that you know there are some uh, trade-offs where like you know it, you can give algorithms uh, to simulate boson sampling that uh, um, you know for a fixed photon loss rate are are asymptotically polynomial, right? And you know Jelmer uh, Renemann and uh, uh, I guess Valerie uh, Skeznovich and, and others have, uh, have have worked on this. Okay, now at first glance, that sounds like it would be fatal for quantum supremacy, right? Because, you know, you always have, you know, at least some constant rate of photon losses. And, uh, you know, but, but now uh, I, I want you to notice that, you know, a, 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 an exactly analogous thing, you know, would be true for the Google experiment. That is, you know, if we have a, like a, a, a random circuit, and then there was even some work uh, by, um, Trying to, to remember the the authors now. Uh, there there was there was some some work that that, that made this explicit. Um, um, all right, I'm not I'm not going to remember the name, but uh, um, um, if uh, each uh, you know if I have a random circuit, let's say, and I have a constant rate of decoherence, then then you know there, there is you know a, and and I just scale up to more and more qubits. Uh, without you know changing that that decoherence rate, uh, the, the 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 noise rate, then 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 there is ultimately an efficient classical simulation for that. Okay, uh, but you know now what what we want to say is well you know look we knew perfectly well that we can't scale up to you know arbitrarily many qubits without doing quantum error correction, right? No one is denying that, right? And you know in some sense you know these classical simulation results are just sort of reconfirming for us that known fact, right? That ultimately you will need quantum error correction if you want to scale these things up, right? And so now, you know, sort of to make uh, uh, the question a fair one, you know, it has to be one about, can you simulate this experiment? Can you simulate, you know, with this noise rate, uh, can you handle 50 qubits, you know, in any reasonable amount of time? With your classical computer, right? So you know, it, you know, an, another way to think about it is that we are, we are imagining that as the experiment was scaled up in the future, it's not only that the number of photons would go up; it is also that the the rate of photon losses would go down, right? So you know, we're thinking of the noise rate as also being an asymptotic parameter, right? Mm -hmm. One that could one that could have been improved with further effort, you know, even even if it, if, 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 if it wasn't yet, okay? And so, so now it comes down to a very concrete question about, well, can you efficiently simulate this experiment classically with these parameters? You know, and again, that is something that people are working on now, you know, including Gelmer, uh, including, uh, you know, Gil, including the Google team and, and others. Uh, we don't have an answer yet. Uh, I am, I'm awaiting the answer as, as eagerly as anyone else. Yeah, I think I will pass on to Gibran to continue. Okay. Um, so following upon Xiaoyang's question, he himself also asks, what should be the next step for boson sampling? Okay. Um, any comment? Yeah, so, okay. So, so I mean, there are, there are several uh, uh, next steps that uh, I think make a lot of sense. Um, 
I mean, at the, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, the, the, the immediate, you know, next step is to sort of clarify the issues that I was just talking about, right? So clarify, uh, uh, you know, how well does this Kalai Kindler uh, hierarchy do at spoofing uh, a lossy Gaussian boson sampling experiment, right? Uh, and and which, which is evaluated using a hog-like test, okay? Now that we know that that is the relevant question, we can laser focus and just get a theoretical answer to that question. And, you know, if I, uh, uh, um, you know, didn't have to, to spend, you know, like, like all but two hours of every day, you know, with, with my kids because of COVID, you know, I would be working on it myself. Okay, but uh, I'll have to, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, implore the community to work on it, I'll say. Uh, and now, you know, of, of, of course, if, if it turns out that this experiment is sufficiently classically simulable, then, you know, one wants to improve it, right? It is obviously, you know, you know like no, no, um, no one disputes that this is the furthest along that any, you know, boson sampling experiment has ever gotten on the road to quantum supremacy, you know, by far. Okay, you know, whether it's, it's all the way there or not is, is what people are trying to figure out. But, uh, you know, one could, um, one, could, one could try to, you know, decrease the rate of photon losses to make it harder to simulate, right? I mean, I mean part of, you know, we, we have to uh, see what the result, what, what uh, we have to see how things develop, right? See what the spoofing algorithm look, looks like, you know, does it take it, you know, how heavily does it take advantage of losses? that would then give the experimentalist, you know, a next target to aim for, okay? But now, um, you know, so, 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 so there is just nailing down the question of, you know, quantum supremacy via boson sampling, you know, which could be enough to occupy people for, for you know, for, uh, for the immediate future, okay? But beyond that, uh, it would be wonderful to uh, be able to do a boson sampling experiment with a reconfigurable device, right? So a, a, a programmable device, you know, where you can you can give it a, or a skeptic can generate the beam splitter network, you know, send it to the experimenter, and then the experimenter, you know, automatically reconfigures their device uh, for that beam splitter network. Okay, that would be uh, uh, awesome. Um, it would be. Wonderful if we could, you know, see some some application for boson sampling. And you know, there have been proposals for applications, uh, and and it's very very hard to find one that you know where where you know if you're you're clever enough, you can't find a, a good classical algorithm that would do the same thing. Okay, but you know, there's a there's a at least a potential application to you know these uh, uh, what are called molecular vibronic spectra. Uh, there's a potential application to, you know, generating uh, cryptographically certified random bits. Uh, you know, one could one could try those things out. Uh, although, you know, uh, like the the random the random bits application, you know, it depends. Like a a a, a prerequisite to it is, you know, cl the clear demonstration of quantum supremacy, right? So, like, you need, you know, if you wanted that application, then getting clearer about you know what it takes for quantum supremacy is sort of is on the critical path uh, for that, um, and um, um, besides that, you know, I mean, I mean, the the sort of the the elephant in the room, or sort of the 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 maybe the 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 biggest direction for quantum optics experiments is going to be to go beyond boson sampling, you know, by incorporating feed forward measurement, you know, that in other words, the ability to measure uh, a mode at some intermediate point, see how many photons are there, and then depending on what you see, change what you are doing to the future photons, you know, to, to the uh, unmeasured photons. Uh, that is what, you know, it would take to boost a boson sampling device up to a universal optical quantum computer. And, you know, of course, you know, people are thinking about that. Uh, I'm sure that the USTC group is thinking about that. I know that Quantum in Palo Alto was thinking about that, and um, you know that you know uh, if if um, um, boson sampling is kind of like a, a way station, you know, along the way to universality, uh, but you know that should be nailed down, and then 
And then, um, you know, ultimately, the goal with uh, photonic quantum computing would be to go beyond that and uh, make a move toward uh, error correction and universality. I'll combine the next two questions. Um, they're essentially asking about what about possible implementations of quantum computers using fermions or anions, or rather than yeah. the boson sampling model. Yeah. So okay. So so the analog of boson sampling with uh, uh, with fermions uh, can actually be efficiently simulated using a classical computer. Okay. So it is not a quantum supremacy proposal. And. That was actually realized, you know, a long time ago. Uh, uh, that was, um, um, you know, ac actually uh, of uh, Leslie Valiant in 2002, you know, effectively <coughs> discovered this, except without realizing that he was talking about fermions. Okay, and then uh, Per Hall and De Vincenzo, uh, two physicists, shortly afterward, point pointed out that, that this is what he was talking about. If I have a system of non-interacting fermions. Then you know their amplitudes, rather than being given by permanence, they are given by determinants, and you know that is a crucial difference. Okay, because the determinant you know is easy to compute with a you know using Gaussian elimination, for example, and uh, and and, so, and related to that, there is an efficient classical algorithm to simulate any fermion sampling experiment. Okay, now uh, we with anions, which are you know these um, um, uh, more complicated type of particle than, than either fermions or bosons um, uh, by Chao Yang. Uh, we should, we should uh, talk later, Chao Yang, by the way. But um, uh, with, um, with, with, with anions, it turns out that, 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 that the, the anionic uh, equivalent of fermion sampling or of boson sampling is already universal quantum computation. Okay. And that was effectively the discovery of Alexei Kataev and others 20 years ago, right? When they showed that if you could create these non-abelian anions, then just by braiding them around each other in an appropriate pattern, you know, you could do all of quantum computation. Okay. And so, so you know, in, in, in some sense, once you have anions, then it's just it's just beside the point to ask about. You know these sampling problems because now you've just got a universal quantum computer, right? You can do whatever quantum computation you want. Okay, the hard part, of course, is to actually build these anions and you know have them work the way that the, the theory says. Um, so now going back to the original motivation for boson sampling coming in from permanents, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. looking back now from the experience gains about what are the restrictions or difficulties in experimentals, uh, that the experimental space. Could we go back and figure out, hey, here's a new model, theoretical model to define for finite quantum memory models, and then that model define a language based on you know, sampling, which would allow us to get a new separation? So kind of go back to kind of the theory part in uh, restricted quantum memory models and say, hey, here's a new language I can define, which will have a nicer kind of structure, perhaps, that can be used for showing quantum advantage. So I don't really understand the question, uh, but you know I, I can say that the, the complexity theory of these intermediate models uh, has been studied, right? I mean that was one of the first things we did when we defined right. these models, right? Is we tried to figure out what can we say about them, you know, complexity theoretically. Now you know to this day we do not have a clear candidate for a language that is contained in you know, boson sampling polynomial time or, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, that, that is not in P or in BPP, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't have a, a we don't know uh, of a language or even a promise problem uh, where um, um, uh, a boson sampling, you know, uh, is, is, is believed to give an exponential advantage, okay? What, what we have are sampling problems, right? So, so, you know, so if you want to see, you know, the uh, uh, advantage from boson sampling, but right, as far as we know today, you really do need to shift your attention to the complexity theory of sampling problems, okay? That really does seem to be crucial, right? But the other thing that we realized, and this is, again, this is old stuff, this is from, you know, 10 years ago, is that once you uh, are looking at the complexity theory of sampling problems, then you can actually relate that 
to the complexity theory of ordinary decision problems, right? And so, mm -hmm. so the kind of theorems that we proved were of the form, you know, if these sampling problems, the ones that are in boson sampling polynomial time, were also in classical probabilistic polynomial time, then um, P to the sharp P would equal BPP to the NP. Or, you know, then like these classical complexity classes would collapse with each other, you know, which are purely classes of decision problems, right? But which, which, you know, and which we, we, we really, really don't think uh, should collapse with each other. Okay, so, so the sampling problems are, can ultimately be related to uh, classes of languages. Um, and then the question is whether nested devices are identified with limited memory. Uh, oh, sorry, no. Uh, which one is more crucial constraint for our supremacy with nest processes, deeper versus wider circuits? That is, do we want more qubits or long range entanglements? Both. You need, <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you really need both, right? Because the goal is you know, you're trying to evade any possible classical simulation. And, you know, there are some classical simulations that will work by just writing down the entire state vector and then just iterating forward, you know, you, you know just, just doing a bunch of matrix vector multiplication. Now, for those, you know, what matters is almost entirely just the number of qubits, right? The number of operations is just like almost completely irrelevant, right? Uh, you know, what matters is do you have enough memory to write down you know, two, uh, uh, two to the n amplitudes, uh, you know, and then and, and, uh, uh, um, um, update, uh, um, update the vector of those amplitudes, okay? Uh, so, so we, and we have to evade those algorithms, okay? But there are other simulation algorithms, uh, most famously the uh, tensor network method or the matrix product state method, okay, that really take advantage of your circuit being shallow, right? And where, you know, the fewer layers of gates there are, you know, the more efficient they will be. We have to evade those as well, okay? And so the, the rule of thumb that is typically used is that the depth of your circuit has to be large enough that sort of mixing takes place. So sort of that every component of your system is able to affect every other component of it many times over, right? That seems like the bare minimum that you could ask for. So for example, the Google chip, let's say it has a diameter of, you know, seven or eight uh, 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 gates, uh, you know, seven or eight qubits to hop from any qubit to any other. Well, then, you know, we want a circuit depth of at least about 20, which, you know, and in fact, that, 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 that's exactly what their circuit depth was. It was 20. Okay. But we need to evade uh, the, the tensor network simulation. Uh, basically, we, we need to be good enough that we're doing that. Now, there are some theoretical results that can give some guidance here. Uh, there are results about mixing behavior, right? Uh, uh, and uh, um, my former student, uh, Saeed Maraban uh, and uh, Aram Harrow uh, have, uh, uh, and others have proven some very strong results about you know, how, how many layers of gates do you need before you have sort of mixing, before your state basically looks like a pseudo-random quantum state. Right, which is you know not uh, um, you know I guess you know uh, strictly speaking that's not a necessary condition for quantum supremacy, nor is it a sufficient condition for quantum supremacy. But you know it seems to be very well correlated with what we want, you know. And so so you know so you at least want a high enough depth that you're seeing mixing behavior and then you're evading the tensor network algorithm. You know, but of course the depth can't be so high that your signal vanishes, right? You need to be able to extract the signal. So you have to be in that sweet spot. And um, given that we still have to reconcile quantum mechanics with general relativity, uh, what do you expect will be the effect of, on quantum computing of that final reconciliation? Uh, well, um, you know, you could say that's, that's you know, in, in a certain sense, that's above my pay grade. Right, uh, you know, this is, um, you know, like, like we are either trying to, you know, confirm quantum mechanics in this totally new uh, regime, or else, you know, if any of these experiments led to a modification of quantum mechanics, then that would be a hundred times more exciting, right? 
that would be, you know, that would be a revolution. Okay, but you know, of course, we uh, we we shouldn't expect that. Now, um, you know, of course, people have been thinking, you know, some of the uh, the the greatest thought on the planet, you know, for generations has gone into this question of how do you reconcile quantum mechanics with general relativity. And you know, we don't yet have a quantum theory of gravity that sort of um, um, describes our world and that sort of makes you know novel predictions that we can check by experiment. Okay, but uh, what we do have, you know, uh, within the last few decades, is we have these sort of toy models, uh, you know, that, that are not our universe. Uh, they, you know, they are anti the sitter space. They have all this supersymmetry. You know, but in those toy universes, quantum gravity actually works, right? You can write down quantum gravity theories by defining them on the boundary of your space time. Okay, so you, know, you can define them on a space time of a different number of dimensions, and then they are holographically dual to sort of a quantum gravity theory that is in the bulk of your space time. This is this famous ADS DFT correspondence, right? And um, you know, the, the high level, uh, um, you know, thing that we've learned from that is that, you know, uh, you know, within those toy models, you know, even quantum gravity can be subsumed under, you know, the umbrella of standard quantum mechanics, right? So, you know, the, the theory that lives on the boundary of your space time is this perfectly ordinary, you know, quantum field theory. Well, it's a conformal field theory, okay, but uh, uh, it is, um, you know, it, it is the, the sort of thing that a quantum computer ought to be able to simulate. You know, it, it involves no change to the usual rules of quantum mechanics. Okay, all of the weirdness is in the mapping, if you like, between that, that boundary theory and what is happening in the bulk. You know, there's like what is happening to an observer who actually lives in the gravitational universe. And now there is some very, very striking recent work, uh, such as by, by Adam Boland and uh, Bill Pfefferman and Umesh Vazirani, uh, that, that tries to study the, the validity of the quantum extended church Turing thesis in ADS CFT. That is like, you know, it does quantum gravity uphold, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the principle that anything in nature should be efficiently simulatable with a quantum computer. And, you know, they give, they, they well, they, they sort of say it depends on what you mean, because uh, you, can, um, you can do these thought experiments that involve observers jumping into black holes that are connected to each other by, by a wormholes. And you can say that, that if, if we could see the experiences of all of these observers then it would be something that could not necessarily be simulated in classical polynomial time. This is the argument that they give. Okay, uh, but the caveats there are that you know there is no one observer who gets to see something you know that is not classically simulable. Right, it's only when you sort of metaphysically combine the experiences of all the different observers, and uh, you know all of these observers are ones who jumped into a black hole. So no, no one outside the black hole gets to ever hear from them again. Okay, so you know, like you know, it, 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 it's not obvious whether this should count, right? But you know, uh, certainly, like when we do experiments far from black holes, or you know, when their results have to be sort of readable, uh, uh, publishable by observers who don't jump into black holes, things like that, then I think ADSCFT is get, has given us some support for the hypothesis that, that, you know, yeah, even quantum gravity can be subsumed into quantum mechanics and can be subsumed into the sort of thing that a quantum computer could efficiently simulate, okay? Until we have the full quantum theory of gravity, we don't know for sure, but that, 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 that I mean, I think that's what we can say based on, based on what we have now. Scott, thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. I, I think sure. we have taken quite a lot of your time um, well, and I, I hope you, also, I hope also, you enjoyed also it. a lot of the audience's time. So, you know, I mean, I mean, I thank everyone for listening, but I don't, yeah. I, know that they, I, know, I know that it's later in Europe and I don't, you know, yeah. and uh, I know, you know, there, there are a lot of questions that I wish that I could have gotten to, but I don't, 
you know, I, I would like to uh, let people uh, get dinner, get to sleep or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So we, yeah. we would have a lot of questions, but, you know, I think you have answered most of them. And um, yes. maybe maybe just one last question, because people right. are interested sure. in in um, in uh, how what so what what would you tell to people who would like to get into this research or maybe they would like to get involved commercially so these are the questions that were somehow centered all right on. well i mean to get involved in the research i mean look i have just been you know spending an hour and a half talking you know uh, about things you know many of which are things that i don't know the answer to and that, you know in many cases that no one knows the answer to okay uh, some of them are very immediate relevance, right? Uh, just, you know, how well can this USTC experiment be spoofed, you know, by, uh, by the, the Kalai Kindler uh, method, right? This is not a metaphysical question. This is a question that an enterprising person could answer in the next couple of weeks. Okay, it just, it hasn't been done. Uh, so, you know, there are lots of ways to get involved. I mean, uh, um, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, uh, if, 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 if one wanted to, to enter, you know, not knowing anything about boson sampling, then, you know, the first step would be, you know, to learn the literature, right? That means, well, you know, I mean, I mean, for, first of all, to learn the literature of just ordinary quantum computing and quantum information, you know, and then to learn the, the boson sampling literature, which, um, you know, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit, I am no longer any sort of expert on, right? Uh, I mean, you know, I, I uh, you know, uh, uh, was involved in the original paper in 2011, right? And, you know, that would be a place to start. You know, I also have lecture notes uh, uh, on boson sampling, like from a course I taught in Rio de Janeiro. Um, um, uh, but then, you know, then, then there's all this follow-up work. There's the work by Kalai and Kindler. There's the work by uh, Renema and uh, Shkesnovich and... Uh, uh, Daniel Brode and, uh, and, and, and all of these others. Um, there's the work on Gaussian boson sampling, okay, uh, and, and Hafnians. So, so, so understand, you know, all, um, um, all of that stuff. And, you know, and then, you know, but I mean, I mean, it, it's not an enormous literature, right? We're talking about, you know, eight or nine or 10 papers. <laughs> and then, you know, one is, you know, if, if one has mastered those papers, then one knows as much as anyone, you know, in, in these fields. And, you know, and, and uh, um, so, so, okay, so, so, so I think that that is a great way to get, you know, um, you know, there are lots and lots of opportunities to get involved at the research level. Uh, on the commercial side, I mean, let's, let's first establish the reality of a quantum speed up here. You know, as I said, you know, even a perfect boson sampling experiment, we don't know if it would have any commercial applications. Um, you know, it, it, you know it, we can't prove that it, that it doesn't, uh, but, um, you know, it, it, you know for, for most of uh, what a quantum computer could do that would be useful, you're really going to want a full, scalable, universal, error-corrected quantum computer. You know, and probably the main significance of boson sampling is as a stepping stone toward that, as a proof of concept, and you know, as a stepping stone toward you know eventual universal devices. Uh, so um, you know, I think that the the, the 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 commercial discussion feels to me like a longer term discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. I don't know if uh, Abu will still want to say something as a closing. Okay. Uh, just thank you, Scott. Uh, thank you, sure. thank you. And hopefully, we can invite you also in the next. Okay. All right. Well, uh, uh, well, well, okay. Well, thank you everyone for listening and um, good to meet you. And uh, for those I already know, uh, it was great to see you and, um, yeah. you know, hope to have more and more opportunities to talk. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for your time. All right. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Thank great. Thank you very much. Was All right. Sure. All right. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk to you later then. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.